Hey everyone, welcome to my next video and in this one I want to continue on my DIY audio deck. I believe this will be the last one until any further progress on the PCB will be done. Uh, so today I want to show you the final stage of the project that I wanted to complete uh, for my assignment as well. So up until this point we discussed uh, the analog design, the code, how to interface with the deck, uh, I even uh, show you the display, how I made this work. And the last thing that was uh, for the display to do is the GUI. So the actual some kind of an interface to change certain parameters and settings of the PCM interface. So in this video, I want to show you that progress in the code. And I actually did another video on this uh, prior to this one. But I won't uh, try to bore you with all the details. So I'll link all the code and everything I'll show you in the GitHub so you can look at it yourself. It's all well commented. And in this video, I just want to show you the main parts and to demonstrate the inner workings. So I have the video feed uh, live right now on the screen. So if I go to the display, you can see that right now we are in so-called uh, status display. So this is the display that is always on. And right now there's clock. You can see that it's been running for hour and a half and it says a uh, sample rate error. Well, this is one of those things. The USB interface that I bought does have the same pinout, but does not in fact have the pins to report the appropriate sample rate to my uh, STM because I tried with another interface board that my friend uh, brought uh, yesterday and it actually worked. So it actually displayed the appropriate sample rates on the screen. But because this one doesn't have that, I don't have anything connected, therefore it just says error. For the uh, interface, I have three buttons. So I have up, OK and down. And you can use these buttons to navigate the, di the display GUI. To enter the GUI, you have to press either of those buttons and you enter the settings display. And when you're in settings display, you can go up and down. You can see there are more uh, items that the screen allows. Therefore, there's some kind of scrolling implemented. Let's say, let's go to the data format and you can see that the default option that is selected from the beginning is in a parentheses. So in this case, it's I squared S 24 bit, but you have all the other options. You can scroll around up and down. And if you click back, we go back to the main display and back to the sub menu, you can see that the cursor left on the last option that we clicked. If you were to click this option and if we go to back to this sub menu, you can see that the cursor now is default on this one. So this is something that I wanted to do. So you know which option was the last that you clicked. So this one is now the last that we clicked. So we have more. So let's demonstrate something. Mute, you can have on and off. So let me play some music. And let me uh, crank up the speakers and let's go from the settings. You can hear the music. Now let's go to the mute. And it muted. Let's go off and off. Okay, so now you can see that it works. Uh, Another thing you might saw, if you leave it alone for five seconds without clicking anything, it goes right back to the status display. So this is one thing that I also implemented, some kind of timeout that actually switches from the setting display back to the status display if no button is pressed. So as long as you press buttons and it's uh, uh, less than five seconds between individual button presses, you will stay in the setting display, regardless where you are, as long as you're moving up and down. Or if you click exit, it will also invite the settings display or the status display to roll over. So um, let me show you a sketch that I've done to show you how this works. So let's go back to the computer and I'm going to open this one. So let me shut down the display. OK, so to show you how everything works, I divide it into a sketch for all the working. So let's start at the bottom. So at the bottom we have the ST's low level driver. So this is what uh, actually performs settings inside the microcontroller. And on the first layer, 
I have the drivers that I actually used just for interfacing to other parts of ST or other devices. Next layer are the devices. So these are the actual devices that, uh, or libraries that actually use these drivers to perform uh, meaningful actions in case for the display, for the DAC and for USB interface. And on the topmost layer is the graphical interface that is divided into two separate parts. One is the settings display and the other is status display. So if you go from the beginning, so the timer is here because unlike low level and a HAL that also implements a, a timer that is driven by an interrupt, I cannot have interrupts because for this project we're using a very simple AirTOS that does not allow any external interrupts. Therefore, I have to implement my own timer for timekeeping and for delays and uh, uh, timeouts. So this is what this timer here is used for. Buttons driver here interfaces with buttons and because it has to also do debouncing, uh, it's in a separate library. It's not just reading the IO pin. Then it's the SPI. And because low level is very bare bones, only just sending some data into data register and reading from it, you have to uh, give around some bit of code. And also I added some timeout functionality because if there were some kind of device that didn't respond to the SPI communication, you could be stuck in an infinite while loop waiting for a response that will never come. And that's why I use the timer also in the SPI driver so the timeout function is used. So I also displayed that in the previous one. On the top, we have the devices that actually use these drivers. So the display uses the SPI to send display data. The PCM uses the SPI to read and write register data. They all use GPIO to either write external pins or in this case USB interface reads the state of the external GPIO pins. And if we go to the top layer, the GUI, that's actually responsible for printing stuff on the display. So we have settings display that prints its own contents onto the display. And also, by the way, if you uh, like I demonstrated by toggling mute, this is called an action. This action will in fact use this PCM1792 device to change its settings. The status display on the other hand also prints its contents onto the display and it also reads the data from the USB interface device. So the state of the separate pins if they were to work on my device. Um, also the actions in this case when you apply a certain settings, I can demonstrate it, also toggle a global flag, a LED flag, it just says it's A over here. So this will toggle a global flag that will blink the LED for very brief period of time so you know that the L, uh, the action was performed so if i enable the display and i take the camera over you can see that there are two leds uh, i'll explain what the orange one is doing but the blue led is blinking for uh, so it indicates that the uh, air toss is working and if i go into the settings display and let's say i apply off on mute when I click, you can see that the red LED has blinked. And if I do again, again. So this is just to inform me that an action was performed. Okay. Um, so this is the, the brief version of what is going on when you're using the device. But what is actually happening is on top. So because we're using uh, AirTOS, which is a real-time operating system, uh, this is a part of operation of the microcontroller that is timed. It has a deterministic response that has uh, times and it has uh, uh, deadlines. So it is very time specific. That's why we call it the real time aspect of the microcontroller. So this is the real time part. And this is non real time part because main happens as fast as it can. So let me show you what I mean by that. So in the beginning of the main, it's, this is the only thing that it's active. AirTOS only initialized over here. First, we initialize the low level driver, so all the SPI, GPIO, other peripherals of the STM microcontroller. And the next is my driver, so buttons, timers, SPI, and all of these devices. So, timer, button, 
and uh, all the, the three devices. So, uh, so display, uh, a PCM and the USB interface. After they're all initialized, it starts the display and prints the initialization status. If it was successful, no problem. It says it was successful and we proceed. If not, if there was an error, either at each of these points, so either the USB interface was not connected, the PCM is not connected, then it will print that error. So it will print the initial status screen and then it will start the AirTOS. I forgot to write here. It will start the AirTOS and also AirTOS is initialized somewhere over here. And then after the initialization, everything that the main does is infinite while loop reading the state of the buttons. Depending on the state of the buttons, if any one of them changes, so if you press a button, it will start the settings display and the settings display will either move the cursor up and down, it will select a menu item, go out of the menu, uh, apply an action, so maybe when you're in a sub menu, you click on an option, it will set an option in the PCM. If you click exit, it will go to the status display itself. Also, there's another error over here. Uh, you notice the five seconds timeout before the settings display would be overridden by status display if no button were to press. Well, each time you press the button, it also uh, resets the timeout uh, variable, a global variable that is shared between the sta settings and status display. So this is to ensure that the settings display keeps its time so you can browse over it so that the scheduler does not interface and just print the status display over it. If you go to the AirTOS side over here, the main part of AirTOS is the scheduler. So this is the actual function that gets called every 20 milliseconds. It's an interrupt function, so it really interrupts main and everything. And it happens every 20 milliseconds. And it calls three different tasks, LEDs, time and action LED. LED is the blue LED you saw in the video, so this is just to show that the AirTOS is working and it's not uh, hanged up on anything. Time mode, on the other hand, also one second pulses, but every time it does that, it increments its own time variable. So this is the to uh, monitor its own time. So in this case, you can see that the current time, if we go to the device, is one hour, 40 minutes, and you can see it incrementing every second. Uh, also, what this task does is it calls another function to, uh, to print the status display. But before printing the status display, it checks whether the timeout is sufficient. So if it is really more than five seconds, in this case, it's, uh, it can be changed since the last print of the status display. Or if the button was again pressed, this timeout is again reset. So the, uh, the status display won't be printed over while you're in settings display. But it also increments the timer regardless of that. Funny is the action LED. So I said that every time I apply an action, it sets this flag, this global flag. Well, what this uh, function does every 50 milliseconds, it actually reads the state of this flag. And if it's a one, it will uh, turn on the LED and set the flag manually back to zero. So the next time this, uh, in the next 50 milliseconds, this one is called, it will set the LED low because the state would be zero. So this one is always applying a quick 50 millisecond on pulse for the LED and then again on the off. So it's just long enough so you can see that an action has performed. So this is the functional description of how this project works. If I go back to the display a little bit more so you can know, uh, see how it's used. So the status display is divided into three things for now. It has the title, clock, and the sample rate. And these two are of different fonts, so they're a bit bigger. And these two are updated constantly every second by the scheduler. So uh, when, every time the scheduler starts, and if the timeout is valid, then it will print the status display, which will print the new time and the sample rate where settings display has two parts. For now, it's hard coded. There are no more sub menus. There are no more like a tree structure. It's only menu and sub menu. So the menu is the all the items you can see when you click uh, into the settings menu. So all the mute, uh, data change, uh, uh, filters, roll offs, phase, uh, mute, 
all of those will be listed over here. You have a cursor on your left that moves up and down and all this free space for uh, all the items is called a page. And there, in my case, there are more items that can fit on a page. Therefore, you have to scroll the page. So there will be also functions that implement that. When you go into submenu, so when you select mute or data format, you go into something called a submenu. So if we go into the uh, here named entity 2, this title will be right under the main title. So you know in which uh, menu uh, menu item you are. So you can see all the submenu options. So this is submenu. It has all the options and each of these options do something. So when you click on, let's say mute, it has off and on. If you click off or on, it will call a respective function. So a function that turns the mute off and the function that turns the mute on. So this will be called an actions and you also have a back. This back will uh, will bring you back to the main display, whereas the exit will uh, reset the uh, timeout, the timeout variable that we know. There's another one that says, hey, I don't want to be uh, anymore in the settings display and the status display will be, oh cool, I'm gonna, just gonna write. So the next time that the scheduler calls the, uh, the time one, it will just print the status display. So this is basically how it works. And in may, uh, future videos, I will show you how the actual display manipulation actually works. But let me show you the code now briefly. As I said, the, all the code will be in the GitHub, uh, so you can read it all you want. Uh, I don't want to bore in this video, I just want to give you like a tour, uh, so you can uh, better move around the code when you're uh, reading it on your own. So let me start in main. There's not much difference, there's just the button initialization. So let me show you the buttons. Uh, the buttons are in the headers, so they're defined over here. So each button has defined its own port and pin. And we have a few statuses, type of buttons. So there are up, uh, OK and down buttons. The button can be open or closed. And we have a structure. For each button I have a structure and this is a very nice way to do so you have all the settings of the button in one place and you have all the states of the button in one place. So it's very easy to make general functions. So when you're uh, initializing the button, when you're calling this function, well we firstly create an array of all the buttons so of the button T type and there are uh, three of them. So what it does, it says, okay, button zero in this case, button up, pin is this one and the button port is this one. So this just assigns the pins and ports to all the button. And when you read, let's go into the main to the button part. When we want to read the button states over here, when you call this function, what it does, it says, okay, so the button zero, one or three or uh, each of buttons in this array, it will use this in order to perform all the actions. So in this case, it will check the state of the, the bounce of this button in particular. It will write a new state into it. It will check its state. And in the end, it will also assign it a new state, whether it's closed and open. Let's just quickly go through the button read. So this button reading is done with the bouncing. So uh, for now, I'm using 10 readings, which can be set over here. So when you come first in this function, it will check if the debouncing is already in progress. We are not because we just came into the function. So the first thing is actually reading the state of the button. So it just uh, writes a new state of the this appropriate button pin and port into the its button state. And then says, okay, if state is zero and we haven't started the debouncing, then it means the button is not pressed. Therefore, just exit the function. This is when is nothing's pressed like right now, uh, this function would just go into this one all the time. But if the button is state one, but the bounce hasn't been started, then this if uh, structure will perform. Okay, so the button is one, so it's pressed, and the bounce hasn't been started. So let's uh, increment the bounce on one, so we know we ha can start, and nothing else will happen. And then we go back because this is a while loop. So unless we manually exit it, this will happen over and over. Now the debounce is different than zero. We, so we can increment it. One, two, three, four, five, six, seven, eight, nine, ten. And each time it will also read the button and uh, 
again if uh, these two function won't perform because the button uh, is now on either one or zero and the debounce is different than zero what will eventually happen is that the debounce will reach a number of 10 and then it says okay so we read the button 10 times and now okay let's reset the debounce and let's see after 10 uh, consecutive readings of the button state is it still one if it's still one then the button was really pressed so we can say the status is closed and return one that means that the button was closed else if after 10 readings uh, the button is not open it means that there was some kind of glitch so it just popped uh, for the state of one for just one or two or maybe three readings but not for majority of them therefore the final reading was not uh, closed therefore we say that the button is open and return zero that means that it was a false uh, reading so when we started the debouncing the first uh, was just really a glitch so this is how i implemented the debounce so every time you read the state you latch it the, so it's not when you press the button it just keeps on scrolling or clicking something really fast so this is uh, to avoid that so it uh, reads the state if the state is different than before so let's say it was zero before and it's still zero this does not uh, this is not uh, that and uh, zero equals zero okay so nothing happens but if now it's a one so the button was really pressed then this is true and if the button is one yes it's one then the action is one there therefore we can we are good to go and then the last state is now one and it's that's for every button that is pressed one and then if let's go back and now the new button press is zero zero is different than one because the last time we pressed the button it was one so this is still true but now it's not one it's zero therefore we don't uh, toggle the up action and the zero uh, the last is equal to zero this is how it resets and if any button was pressed we called the display settings function so this is the one that actually toggles the settings display and we toggle back the all the action buttons to zero so it resets we also toggle this uh, orange led that you saw in the video rapidly so we know that the main function hasn't stalled on any while loop because ertos will be still working because it just interrupts everything so the main can halt but the uh, ertos can work that's why i have this orange led that just infinitely fast toggles so i know that while loop is alive and we have the blue one second period led that uh, blinks so i know that the real time part of the function is alive okay so let's go quickly over the gui so i can show you what are the parts of the gui so if we start in the header file here we define how many items in the menu and the sub menu we have so this is a maximum amount so in this case it's six and six for both and plus one so this is the plus exit and this is the plugs back so we have to also account for the back and the exit button at the end of the lists we have a new type def for a pointer to a function which will be used to assign different functions to actions the errors you saw the errors in the previous video and then we have these two structures the first structure called menu item t is used to label all the data that is in the menus and submenus. so this one is only for the menu it holds all the menu names so this is for every menu item so what is the name of this menu item what are its submenu options so in this case if we were talking about mute this the name of it would be mute the option would be on and off number of items would be two but this can be changed because uh, the submenu item number again it's six plus one or six but we have like in mute just two options this number of items will be updated so the the length of the list is dynamic and not always the maximum amount so you would be scrolling on black so empty space and then it's an array of all the actions for the submenu items so it's a pointer function array of all the items and here we would give in all the pointers to the functions that are being triggered by the submenu items so again if we were in mute off and on functions we'll have an off and on 
actions. Let's go quickly to this action so we'll uh, follow what I'm talking about. So here are all the functions that start with name action. They do only one thing, they do not return, they do not accept any arguments. So all the PCM mute does, it calls this function from the PCM file that uh, toggles the mute on one and the unmute calls this the same function but it toggles it on zero. So you can see that these are functions are all the same they just have different parameters depending on the library that I wrote for the uh, PCM1792 but these functions are specific so they can be just called without any arguments and without any return function so this is very simple and, and elegant so these are the functions that will be called by the submenu item when you choose them so when you click on the on for the mute this one will be called so this has to be stored somewhere. So they are stored in the over here actions. But you know that this is just an empty husk. So this is just a structure. So we have to fill in those structures. So if we go to GUI.C, we have, okay, here's the timeout definition and the status timeout. So this is the one that will be constantly uh, resetting in order to keep the status screen from overlapping the setting screen. Here are some limits, so how many items is the maximum per page and how many are now. So this is for the menu and for submenu. And here's all the actual data that will be filled into, in our case, let's start with menu item T. So menu item T will be firstly filled with the name of all the menu items. So menu item T will have an array of all the menu items. In this case, there are six of them and each of them will get their own name. So the first one will get mute next data format output phase and so on and each of those menu items will get its own submenu items so in this case mute has two submenu items on and off and parentheses label the default action this is just for the user so this will be also in the the uh, uh, set into the uh, menu item also, what will be later is the uh, default position. This is so we can initialize the cursor position in the beginning. And here are all the actions. As you can see, these are all the functions that I showed you before. They are in the same order as the function that will be called. So submenu uh, uh, actions on and off will call a PCM mute per PCM unmute. And uh, uh, FMT changes from this one to the default one over here will call these different functions for different FMT modes and uh, let's say okay phase reversal so the phase reversal menu has sub menu items normal and inverse and these two will call the rev normal and rev inverse so this these are all the information so this is just a big pile of information that is being dumped into respected menu item t which is a list that is the length of the menu items so in this case it's six maximum as you can count one two three four five six exit is still a valid uh, item but it's just used for uh, exiting the setting display so this is the actual list that will be filled with all this data that we just saw right now so let's go forward to the next one which is the also the important so how do we know where we are on the page so when i started to write this driver i had to know okay so where is the cursor right now and then i thought okay so there are more items that i can fit on one page therefore i need to implement some kind of uh, scrolling so i did that by calling it a page so i have uh, cursor position for the current menu that we are in and the current page position if we go to the bottom of the page and then we want to go forward but the cursor is on the limit then there's will be a function called that will scroll down so this will increment the page number and there's also number of pages so we know how far we can scroll and this depends on the size of the page which is variable as you can see in the beginning of the GUI the page size can be lower than the maximum page size but not greater than therefore I have this error over here and the number of pages which is the maximum number of pages is by the number of menu items uh, minus the menu page size plus one so this is how many uh, items can fit on one page but it's not done for the submenu because submenus can uh, breed so some submenus can have like mute only two items 
but uh, some of them have all those, so all six submenu items. So there's uh, uh, additional functions performed in the initialization to determine the uh, maximum number of the page items. So number of pages is different for submenus than menus. To differentiate between the submenu and menu, because menu will be just one, so this is the main menu, and submenu will be for every menu item. So for every menu item, so mute data format, so these will all be their own submenus. Therefore, if we go down, we have a menu T, only one for global menu, and a whole array of submenus. So these are different from zero to five in this case, or in this case, zero to six, because we have one for the exit as well. Uh, also, we have a, a pointer to current menu and current submenu, and because it's easier to operate on uh, a pointer that is assigned appropriate one. So the pointer can point to this global menu structure or any of the submenus. So this is just to create a simple functions that operate with just one pointer and not always have to do if and else's to determine whether we have to look into the global menu settings or the appropriate submenu. Also, we have in that nature also submenu function pointer. So we can just ingest a pointer to a particular location where it has to point, let's say onto this function. And then we can say, oh, is this a valid function? Is this, I say, different than zero? What if we were to point into a menu item over here that does not exist? Therefore, the submenu function pointer would be null or zero. Therefore, we can preemptively uh, just say, oh, it's zero, don't do anything. Um, so uh, the last a few parts are the X page, X curse and X flag. These are in place just in order to uh, keep uh, the current uh, cursor position fixed. So uh, if I showed you like before, let me switch back to the display. Let me align it. So if I go to the data format and I click on, let's say this one, and I go back, you can see that the cursor is now on the last option that I clicked. Now let me just scroll up and down and up and down and I scroll to the back and click back. And now the system will be, okay, I clicked back. So let me go to the previous cursor position, which is in this case, X cursor that was validly clicked. So the last position that I actually clicked. So in this case, this is the last valid one, even though the back position is greater. So the cursor would intuitively continue on the back button. So if I were to click data format, it will land on back, but I switch back to the X cursor. So this is why I use X cursor and X page again, because you can have multiple items. So this is for the menu. So this is used when printing and modifying the cursor position, scrolling and everything like that. This is the menu. So it holds the information of the current screen. Where are we? So when we are in main screen, so over here, this is uh, right now we're scrolling in the G uh, menu. So if we go to the GUI, uh, so right now we're scrolling in the G menu. Or in fact, we're actually scrolling uh, the menu current or the sub menu current is now pointing to the G menu structure. Now, if I clicked mute, right now the sub menu current is pointing to the sub menu element zero because the mute is the first element. And now we're back pointing to the global menu. If I go to the data format, right now the sub menu current is pointing to the sub menu item one, so the second item in the sub menu array. So let's quickly see how that's working. So the function that we go into when we uh, press any button in the main is called the display settings in which we input arguments for each button. So let's just, so if we press this button, let's say, okay. So if any button was pressed and the screen was not toggled to the settings display, so we haven't been in the settings display up until this point, Okay, set the screen toggle to one. So we know that now we're in the settings display and we reset the status timeout. So this is that timeout that will keep the status display from printing itself all over us. Then we clear the display and print the menu page and the cursor. Oh, so yeah, so the cursor, so this part is separate from the menu because there's a separate logic for printing uh, uh, cursor and for printing page. So these are two separate functions. That's why they have to be called two different function. 
And as you can see, I'm passing the reference the directly the global menu because I know I have to print the global menu right now. But after that, when I click on again another button, we say, oh, so are we still in the settings menu? This means that the screen toggle is still at one and the status display hasn't cleared that. Okay, so we're still in settings menu. That means that we have to wander up and down. First, what we do is we reset the timeout. So this is the timeout that is uh, uh, keep getting reset so the status display doesn't uh, roll over. And uh, this is managing the last position. So that last page and last cursor is being saved over here before going into further functions. And then if we pressed up, we call the function that move the cursor up. And you can see that the menu current is pointing to the global menu. You cannot see that if you go into the initialization function right after that, you can see that the menu current will be pointing to the uh, global menu, so to this one. But if we were into submenu, this one will be pointing to a submenu. So this is universal. So it's actually working with just the same pointer over and over again, but the value of the pointer, so where it's pointing to, changes depending on where we go over the code. So this is just for the up down. And if we go to the bottom, so we cannot go further, so something like here, if we were to press again, the pointer will go off screen. But I don't do that. I, uh, when the pointer goes to the bottom and it go, cannot go any further, it will say, okay, the this function for the cursor down in this case will raise a flag called cursor limit down. And this function move page down will be called in order to move the page down if it can. If it can't, if it's at the maximum, let's say over here when we're on the exit, if it's on the maximum, it cannot go further. If I press the OK button, now here's the main difference. So if I press the OK button in the main menu, we go into the uh, main menu. So over here. But if we're in submenu, like over here, if I press the button, it performs a certain action and takes me back to the main menu. So there are two different things that can happen with the same button. So if the parameter of the uh, menu we are currently in, so this menu, cu uh, menu current that points to the current menu, is not submenu because submenu would have this parameter at one, that means we're in main. That means we want to go into a function or into a main menu, or if we are on the exit option button, we want to go out. Therefore, if we are on the exit button, we reset the position of the cursor and page and a screen toggle to zero, which means that we don't want to be in the uh, status screen, which means that the next time the status screen will be toggled at the one second mark, it will reprint itself. But if we're not on the exit button, we are on the menu item, we want to enter the menu item. So we call this function menu selection one, which means we want to go into the menu that we are right, right into the sub menu that we are hovering on right now. But if we uh, were not in the main menu, but if we were in the uh, sub menu, which is this else over here, means, okay, re return the external flag and now call this function, but with zero, which means take me now back to the uh, main menu and perform an action. So let me just show you this function, what it does. Uh, so if we wrote one means that we are in the menu, but we want to go into the sub menu, which means that we have to change where this menu current points. So instead of pointing up until now, it's been pointing to the global menu. Now it has to point to one of the sub menus and it calculates to which sub menu depending on the position of the current cursor and page. So if I were to go, oh, I can, you can see that. Uh, okay, uh, so if I were to go into the, let's say, data format, the cursor position is 1 and the page is 0 because we didn't need to scroll anything, which means that this would be 1 and this would be 0, therefore the submenu item 1. And the submenu item 1 is the, uh, in this case, it's the data format. So it will select a pointer to the submenu of the data format. And the data format submenu has all the information of where it's the current cursor of it is and the current page it is and all the X flags. 
So what we'll do is we use this information on the new pointer of to which menu it's pointing to in order to print the new cursor and the page. So this is what does when you press the button. So this happens. So it selects the appropriate submenu and prints the new cursor. So this is the cursor where it is inside the submenu and the page. But if the submenu uh, option was not one, but zero. So we are already in the submenu and we want to go out which means that we are something like here when you click mute and off, it has to perform a certain action that is associated with this submenu item, in this case off, which is the item number one, and also exit back. So what it does, it says, okay, so where are we pointing to right now in the global menu? So we go to back to the menu list and we now see by reference, we're not using the menu current, we're using the directly global menu and we're saying where is the cursor pointing to on the global menu. So this is so how we know where on the global menu we are. So in this case, we were in the mute, this global menu cursor and page will be both zero. So mute is the first element. And then of that menu item, what are their actions? So in the mute sense, there are the on and off actions. In order to select uh, one of those two, we have to now know the current position of the cursor and the page of the submenu we're in. So this is the submenu position over here. So this is cursor zero, page zero, cursor one, page zero. So in this case, when we click off, this would be item number one. So the action number one would be to turn it off. And we take that pointer to the function that would call that. So this is a P function and transfer it to a temporarily a tam a holder for the submenu function because we have to check if it's not zero. Because what if you, uh, you were to have an action that didn't have a populated uh, function? So let's say if you wanted to click uh, mute zero, but no action has been um, saved in the actions over here. Therefore, you have to check if it's not zero. If it's not zero, then you just add the parentheses and call this function. So this will perform a certain function and then raise the A LED flag. So this flag will be set so it can, uh, uh, so the Ertos function for the action LED can light up the, that red LED for 50 milliseconds. So we know that we performed an action. So we performed an action or not. Now you have to check if it was a back button. If it was a back button that this didn't happen, or at least this if uh, if statement didn't happen, and we check for back button just for the last item in this current page. So the current page cursor and page plus one is the last item. And we know that because we have previously recorded the number of items in the current submenu. In this case, we reset the cur current cursor and page to the X cursor X page, because as I showed you before, the back button doesn't uh, count. And then we just point the menu back to the global menu uh, and then print the global menu once again. So this is the second part. So when we click on mute off and even if it was back, it will print the global menu from that point on. And that's it. Um, there again function on top. So here's the uh, screen start function and this will actually fill in the sub menu and global menu items. So it will fill them with all the uh, sizes, page size, uh, initial cursor position. Uh, here it will fill it menu names. It will check the number of items by the naming. So if the name is invalid, then it will won't increment by one. And then uh, over here, it will save the number of items, submenu names, and back button, uh, the number of pages will be again updated. And that's it. In the end, it just uh, clears the screen under the title and that's it. So you can look at those uh, and there are a function to move page up and down and print page and stuff like that. Only one that I want to show you right now uh, that is left is the display status. So this is the other half. So now we were in the uh, settings display. Now we go to the status display. So what the status display does. So if you remember the screen toggle, the screen toggled to one if we entered the settings display. If this variable is on zero, which means that we are not in the settings display. So we are already in the screen display. So in the status display, which means, oh great, just clear the display under the title, 
print new time, print new sample rate and update screen. And that's it. But if we're right now in the settings display, like here, and uh, when this function is called, this function is called by the AirTOS every second. Uh, so right now it would say, okay, the screen toggle is now on one. So let's go to the else statement over here. And the toggle is default on one, which means that now we, uh, we're ready to toggle back from the settings display. Okay, so the settings display is now active. Now let's toggle zero. So we know that now we have already uh, acknowledged that the settings display is present. And remember the time that this happened. We go out and uh, screen, uh, status timeout is zero. Well, this means that the screen has reset the status timeout. So this function, every time it will complete, regardless of what it does, if the setting display is active, it will set some kind of ticking bomb. Over here, you can call it like that. So it will set this variable to one, which means every time this function will uh, finish, it will, next time it will want to enter this mode. So it will force. So every time explicitly the setting display has to reset the status timeout. If not, this is going to happen. And it's going to happen because this timeout will be one because it won't be reset by the settings display. Plus the timeout will be reached. So the current time will be greater than the last time this was uh, this happened. And plus the timeout in this case, it's five seconds. And in this case, we just say, okay, so now I have uh, toggled over the settings display, thus resetting the toggle parameter. The toggle is now on zero, which means that yes, it's overridden the settings display. So the settings display will know to next time just enter it. Now the current pointer is on the global menu. So even if the uh, we were like, let's say inside of the settings over here, and we wait five seconds, and let's go click. We're now on the global menu or in the main menu. We're not inside of this one. So we have actually also reset the current pointer to the menu, which is great. So we always start in the main menu, not in some option. And again, just like in the top, clear the display under title, print clock and separate and update the screen and set it to one. So we know that we can go in here again. So there are just the screen clock and the screen sample rate. And that's it, really. Uh, only thing is that the AirTOS, and I can show you that one as well. So AirTOS task, let's just open this one. So we have three tasks. There are a type of AirTOS task T. They, each one of them has the, uh, the name uh, function that will be called. Uh, the, uh, the last tick that it was called. So we know which uh, task is uh, maybe uh, catching up its period and priority. Uh, so in this case, blink function has the same priority, but they have uh, separate periods. So they only encounter one every five times. And this one will call blink action. This one called blink and this will be called time driver every one second and has the highest priority. And if we go to the time driver, the time driver, as we can see, will have a local static variable time and time will increment every second so every time this function is called and then it will call the display status so this is the function that we just talked about whereas the blink action we have a global variable a led flag that you saw over here in the gui if you go to the top over here is defined as extern so what it does if this flag is one well it resets it and writes the led high so the next time this function is called and no other action has performed again will say okay it's zero so let's write the led to zero and that's all uh, the blink function just actually reads the led just inverts the state and that's all maybe i can show you the ertos uh, this is the init function so this is just initializing uh, ertos on a low 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 level because that's how i'm used to so basically just calculating the appropriate ticks to determine the 20 milliseconds uh, sample rate and if this is not uh, correct, it will return an error unless it just initializes the IRQ uh, and returns success and AirTOS enable disable, but all the AirTOS actions are performed in the interrupt function, which is in main over here. So this is in sysTick. Where are you? 
here it is cystic handler so this is modified so make sure to write under the user code begin so this is all the scheduler uh, oh something is in slovene so maybe i'll just uh, translate a few of these things but a few things that are in english yeah it's all in english so this is the simple ertos routine that performs all the task calls so it's Oh, well, it's 50 minutes. So this is an overview of the code. Again, as before, I will include all the files that you need to study this project if you want to follow along in the GitHub. And for all other questions, I'm available in the comments. But until I make a, with my friend a new version of the PCB that will be worth reporting on, I'll just continue on the tutorials and maybe on the uh, low level since I've been using it for quite some time now. So again thank you for watching i hope you find this entertaining and i give and i gave you a few ideas for your own project in the future so thank you and i'll see you next time bye